great pleasure to be here and speak uh, as a director of a think tank that has been working the last few years on the issues that I will present to you. I will take you on a little journey that will turn around the issues raised by this document you see, the European Convention on Human Rights, that will ask the question of how secure the protections we as Europeans take for granted to protect our rights really are, that will show some of the challenges and uh, really some shocking stories, and that will finally conclude with an appeal for us to do something now. Let me begin in 1954, however, pretty far away, in the United States. This was a decision by the US Supreme Court, Brown versus Board of Education, which actually ended almost 100 years since the abolishment of slavery, the publicly um, justified segregation, the legal segregation in public schools that existed still in the south of the United States. Now, this was a major turning point for the civil rights movement, and it was associated with a Supreme Court at the time led by this man, Earl Warren. Earl Warren became later known as the most liberal Supreme Court uh, chief judge. He'd been a Californian, a prosecutor, a governor. Throughout his professional career, he's been a defender of civil rights, attacking privilege, fighting for fairness, and as he put it in 1938, the American concept of civil rights, he writes, includes the absence of arbitrary action of government in every field. A noble man, a great man, and yet there is this. When Earl Warren was Prosecutor General and Governor of California during the Second World War, he also supported, condoned, helped implement and justified one of the most racist policies in American history. This wasn't about African Americans, this was about Japanese. The detention of 112,000 Japanese Americans with no evidence of any sabotage of which they were accused, some of them US citizens, many of them two-thirds born in the US, taken for three years inland to camps with barbed wire, with guards, property confiscated. And Earl Warren kept defending that, arguing if the jobs are released, this was the sl slang at the time, no one will be able to tell the saboteur from any other Japanese citizen. Now, this is not a distant memory, alas. Many, many decades later, Earl Warren uh, had regrets. But just last week, we saw a supporter of Donald Trump on Fox News argue that perhaps in the way you treat Muslims in America, this registry the president-elect has talked about, the example of treating the Japanese Americans in 1942 might offer some useful indications. If somebody like Earl Warren could fall for and justify such a policy, imagine what lesser men are likely to do. It is the theory of dehumanization, as the moral philosopher Richard Rorty put it. It is the instinct in so many of us, under moments of pressure and in a climate of insecurity, to begin to define human as people like us, and human rights as the rights of people like us. The problem, he said, Rorty, is not the psychopath. The problem is the ordinary decent man or woman, soldier, judge, or politician, who is loved by his friends, who loves his children, but who considers that under pressure, the human rights for his group should not be extended to others. What we need, Rorty says, is sentimental education. As he put it, sad and sentimental stories that create empathy, sympathy, that makes us care. Reason alone will not work under pressure. Now, let me give you a European example as well, a European saying, this man, Robert Schumann. 2013, Luca Volonte, he will appear again in my presentation, an Italian Christian democratic politician, uh, proposed and argued strongly that Robert Schumann should be canonized by the Catholic Church, should become a saint, which is rare for a politician in the 20th century. Schumann was in the French resistance. He was captured by the Gestapo. He was, as foreign minister and prime minister, a creator of all the post-war European institutions. He was there when the Council of Europe was set up to defend human rights in 1949. And he was, of course, famously the man who proposed the Schumann plan for coal and steel. So today, on that day on which he made his speech, is the official holiday of the European Union. A great man, you will think. Well, certainly, 
and we still benefit from his legacy. So what am I going to say about him, you will wonder? It's here. Robert Schuman was Minister of Justice in 1955. A war had erupted in French Algeria. A state of emergency was declared when he was Minister of Justice. And in August 1955, he and a leading French general issued a declaration that gave the security forces in French Algeria practically total impunity. By 1956, detention camps were authorized. The human rights situation in French Algeria, which was considered territory of France, deteriorated dramatically. This was happening despite the fact that France and the European Convention of Human Rights already existed and France had been a founding member of the Council of Europe. It happened after the UN Convention and Declaration of Human Rights was in place. And in 2001, this French general, Paul Osares, published a book where he actually not only justified torture, but he said that it, it was obviously the standard policy uh, that politicians in France had recommended to the military in French Algeria. Only rarely, he writes, were the prisoners we questioned during the night still alive the next morning. And of the 24,000 people who were put under house arrest under the state of emergency, more than 3,000 disappeared. As he puts it in this book, um, the justice system would have been paralyzed had it not been for our initiative, the initiative being extrajudicial killings and regular torture. So where are we today if France, after the agreement to the European Convention of Human Rights, could do this? If Schumann, one of the great noblemen of post-war Europe, as Minister of Justice, could recommend such policies, how sure can we be today that the European Convention, the Council of Europe, all the institutions we have, will actually protect us or protect others in other European countries if they are put under pressure? We have lots of institutions, more than ever before, to defend human rights. We have a court in Strasbourg. We have the Council of Europe with a secretariat. We have a parliamentary assembly in Strasbourg. We have a committee of ministers of 47 Council of Europe members. This man, the Secretary General of the Council of Europe, a Norwegian former Prime Minister, was also the chairman of the Nobel Peace Prize Committee. So what is the Council of Europe going to do to defend us? There is also a human rights commissioner. Well, I give you another anecdote, and now I take you to the present. In 2001, a small Caspian Republic, Azerbaijan, joined the Council of Europe. This is its president, Ilham Aliyev, the son of the previous president who used to be the KGB general in Soviet times. In 2012, my think tank, ESI, published this report on Kabir diplomacy, because what we found and what we warned about was that this tiny state of eight million people, Azerbaijan, had managed to capture, undermine, and completely pervert one of the most important human rights institutions in Europe, the Council of Europe. How had it done so? Well, let me give you an illustration. In January 2013, there was a vote on political prisoners. This vote was put together because Azerbaijan had started to arrest a large number of dissidents, journalists, youth activists, many friends of us. The vote was put together, the resolution by a German SPD member of parliament, the Bundestag, and it called on, well, Azerbaijan should stop arresting people for speaking their mind. The outcome of this vote, which was the best attended vote on a resolution in the history of the Council of Europe Parliamentary Assembly, was 125 for Azerbaijan and 79 for the resolution. And it was defeated. Right after this, well, here are the people who defeated it. All the Russians, all the Turks, all the Spaniards, most Italians, the majority from the UK, from France, from Ukraine. A large rainbow coalition from Greek extreme left to Italian conservatives, from Russian neo-fascists to British Tories. And right after the vote, these people were arrested. They had actually worked in Azerbaijan for the Council of Europe. One had run a school of politics. The other was the human rights expert and advisor to the Council of Europe Parliamentary Assembly member who wrote the report that was defeated and right after he was arrested and put in jail and sentenced to many years. Under these conditions, what can NGOs do? Well, they can shame, they can write, but whenever NGOs alerted the public to this, Ilham Aliyev, the president, would give a speech and would say, listen, the Council of Europe has said that we have no political prisoners. How can you shame us? We are honorable. The trick was to capture the language. 
What Ali have realized and what other autocrats have realized in recent years is that democracies, people like us, rarely even know what's going on in Strasbourg. We take these institutions for granted. In the meantime, cover diplomacy, which was the conscious and strategic buying of influence, inviting dozens of people to Baku uh, every year, bribing people, blackmailing people, building up networks, had managed to turn the Council of Europe into an institution that in every election that took place in Azerbaijan, and elections with huge amounts of ballot stuffing, uh, the Council of Europe delegates would say these elections were fully free and fair, and where dissidents were officially hooligans. At the moment, in Europe, we see a return to the politics of fear, but we also see an open challenge to the idea of the European Convention. The British government has said it wants to get out of the uh, binding nature of the European Convention of Human Rights. Russia has already ruled that the judgments from the court no longer directly apply. Everywhere in Europe we have politicians who say, like Gerd Wilders recently in the Netherlands, perhaps, perhaps we have too many Moroccans in this country. We are seeing the prejudice being built up at a time when the institutions we need to defend us and to defend minorities and to defend the vulnerable are weakened through indifference and corruption. Here he is again, Luca Volonte, the man who wants Robert Schumann to be a saint. This week, there was a documentary shown on Italian TV, public TV, Rai Tre. Um, it is called Report. It is the most important investigative format on Italian television. It was all about Luca Volonte and the Council of Europe and Azerbaijan. And it put the question to him why he had accepted a contract for millions of euros from the Azerbaijani government while he was the chairman of the biggest political faction, the European People's Party, in the Parliamentary Assembly at the time of the vote on political prisoners in January 2013. Actually, in the interview, and if you understand Italian, you can watch it, it is online, in the documentary, Volonte was also asked by the Italian journalist, is it true that you wanted to be the new commissioner for human rights? And Volonte sort of smiles and says, yes, I want to continue my international career. To which the interviewer says, but isn't it strange that you have received millions of euros from the Azerbaijani government? To which Volonte says, that's an interesting question. Actually, right now the Italian prosecutors in Milano are investigating uh, his case. So what can we do? Well, the very first thing we can do, hopefully, is to become more suspicious. To not take all the nice institutions that we believe exists and will defend us and others for granted. The Council of Europe, the Committee for Prevention of Torture, the conventions, the commissioners, the human rights prices, all of this, which is the infrastructure of human rights protection, will not work if we don't pay attention. Will not work if we don't ask our elected politicians what they do when they go to Strasbourg. Will not work unless we focus on how basic human rights violations like torture and political imprisonment are returning to Europe in recent years. Half a century ago, this was an article in an English newspaper, The Observer, by Peter Berenson, The Forgotten Prisoners. Out of this article emerged an initiative, out of that initiative emerged an organization, Amnesty International. But today we still have dissidents in Europe. Anna Mamadli was the man who was arrested after the resolution on political prisoners. He was the man who'd worked on political prisoners before. In 2014, he received the Václav Havel Prize, which is the human rights prize given by a committee appointed by the Council of Europe, which is a wonderful thing. Only when he received that prize, he was in jail, and Azerbaijan was the chairman of his institution, or the institution giving him the prize. Khadija Ismailova, and I leave you with her, is one of the most impressive journalists and activists in Europe today. She's an Azerbaijani woman. She is fearless. She's also a friend. She's been attacked and tried to be broken by the government. They tried to, actually they did, put a camera in her bedroom to film her with her boyfriend, to then blackmail her, to try to shame her into being silent. She then made a press conference, announced what had happened and said, I will not be silenced. They tried to accuse her of being a different ethnic group to inspire hatred. In the end, they put her on trial and sentenced her to jail. Recently, she was released, unbroken. 
She's under house arrest. She can't leave Azerbaijan. She's now in her house, not under house arrest, in Baku. But this is what she said and wrote in an article that she smuggled out of prison to the New York Times one and a half years ago. We see clearly what we must fight for. Life is very complicated, but sometimes we get lucky and we're offered a clear choice between truth and lies. So here is the challenge. Can we, this generation, when we thought that dissidents, Havel, Sakharov, are men of the past, that torture and political imprisonment are issues that no longer affect us, can we rouse the same passion as the generation that created Amnesty in 1961? Can we defend our European human rights institutions against the onslaught of skeptics, populists, or the cynical mainstream politicians that are ready to sell out our values? Can we begin to act and take seriously what we've inherited? Because in the end, this is what will defend us under pressure and minorities that will always come under pressure when people feel insecure. I think we need to give the answer. And I think we need to give the answer now. So that's why I want to thank the organizers for this opportunity to speak. And I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you. <laughs>